Good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted uh, that you are here for CareNet's 45th anniversary conference. Um, the entire team, as you can see already, is, is so delighted that you joined us this year, social distancing, online, all of that. <laughs> wow, it's pretty, pretty amazing as we've planned this. Now, you know, last year I, I spoke uh, about the topic of love versus tolerance and really asked this question, are Christians called to be tolerant? And, you know, as a result of uh, that talk last year, some folks asked me to kind of put that into a booklet or to codify it. So I've done that. Each one of you should have one of those in your um, conference bag. But also, if you want to get additional copies, uh, you can certainly get those from uh, CareNet or CareSource, if you will. But, you know, when I was thinking about this year, what to speak about, and I was praying about my remarks, you know, I, I said to myself, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't frame them in the context of the times in which we find ourselves in our nation. Indeed, we are certainly in challenging times on a number of fronts. We have the uncertainty of COVID-19 that challenges us to, to question the certainty of God and the certainty of God's promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. We're challenged to react as the culture tells us to react to any crisis, that we're supposed to have fear, we're supposed to isolate ourselves, or be, be in a period of isolation, and we're supposed to hoard. No doubt when the historians look back on the spring, this past spring, they will certainly note the great toilet paper rush of 2020. <laughs> Indeed, we may be facing the zombie apocalypse of a virus in COVID-19, but at least our bottoms will be clean, amen? <laughs> in all seriousness, though, as Christians, you know, we're, we're called to really reject the culture's approach to any crisis. We're called to exchange our fear for faith in God, our isolation for engagement with our neighbors, and our hoarding for sharing of our time, our talent, and our treasures. Now, we're, we're also facing a time of great division in our nation and racial unrest. As many of you know, I addressed my concerns about what happened to George Floyd and others in an extended video interview with, with Vince DeCaro, and then also, again, in a question and answer webinar, which you can get access to through the intranet portal, if you'd like to see that again, or if you haven't seen it. But based on a conversation I had with a pregnancy center a couple months ago, I, God really put on my heart that I needed to share some more on this topic. Now, I, I know that some of what I'll share may be a bit counter to what's being said in some circles. And my remarks will challenge some perspectives, I suspect. But I hope that you will hear not just my words, but also my heart. As my staff knows, I say often that when I speak by God's grace, my goal is to set folks' minds ablaze without setting their hair on fire. <laughs> it's a delicate task, but I will try. That said, as you know, we're challenged to state publicly with words in social media, uh, our lawn signs, whatever, we're supposed to state what matters, what matters. And what saddens me and breaks my heart is that there are family ties that are being frayed. There are long-standing friendships that have been ended, and even church congregations that have been divided over which three words you will say or not say. Black lives matter, all lives matter, or some variation of that. Those three words that you will say or not say. Sisters and brothers, something's the matter. You see, we are challenged to draw our lines in the stand and draw our rhetorical swords on a battlefield that the culture has laid out for us. We're supposed to declare whose side we are on. And you know, as I considered this, God gave me, and, and, and gave me a perspective and took me to Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15. The Word of God says, when Joshua... 
was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord and I have come. Now I have come. So what's going on here? Well, Joshua is about to lead the Jewish people, God's chosen people, into the promised land, and he sees this man, a special man, the commander of the army of the Lord, who is really the pre-incarnate Christ. And he asks this man a question, one that you would expect to be answered with, yes, I'm with you, but it's not. And as I considered this man's response, it dawned on me that Joshua was asking the Son of God a question that he and we should be constantly asking ourselves. Are we on God's side? Are we on God's side? Are we for him or are we for his adversary, the evil one? And secondly, in this culture and at this time, we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be on God's side? side. Now, as I considered this, I, I thought there's, there's some interesting things that you should think about when you kind of debate this question in your own mind and in your own spirit. I was reminded of two of Jesus' disciples, Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot, who couldn't have been more different in terms of their worldviews and their passions. You see, Simon the zealot was at war with the Roman government, and he was so passionate about this, so vocal about this, so committed to this, that his very identity was wrapped up in the struggle, so much so that Zealot was added to his name. He was really the Jewish Lives Matter guy of the day. <laughs> now, Matthew, on the other hand, was a tax collector for the Roman government. He was part of and aligned with the system because the system was benefiting him. And given his name and his identity, it was in the system. So he is on the opposite side of the political, the social, and maybe even the religious divide from Simon. And they both came to follow Jesus. Now, initially, they both came to him because they had their agendas. And, and they probably thought, well, Jesus would help them accomplish their agendas. I imagine Simon the Zealot thought, well, Jesus, if he's the Messiah, the king, he would take down the Roman government, even if it was violent. Even if he had to use violence, he would take down the Roman government. And Matthew, who was in a power position as a tax collector, may have thought that when Jesus came to power as a close follower of Jesus, he would be well positioned to get a top role in this new system. So it's not a stretch to imagine that these two men, once they learned each other's perspective and politics, they had some very heated conversations around the campfire, probably within earshot of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was asked that question about, should we pay taxes? I could definitely see that same conversation and an argument between Matthew and Simon. Matthew probably expected Jesus to say yes, because it's the law. And Simon expecting Jesus to say no, because of the Roman occupation or that the tax laws were unjust. But here's a key insight. Jesus never engaged in the debate of the day in the way that the culture expected or even demanded. You see, when Jesus was handed that coin and challenged with the question of should we pay taxes by those who sought to trap him, he transcended the cultural debate about whether taxes mattered and refocused the discussion on the things of God, the heart of the matter, the heart of man. When he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God's. And remember when Jesus was having that conversation with the woman at the well? a Samaritan on the other side of the gender, racial, culture, and religious divide. And she wanted to engage in the argument of the day when she said, our fathers worship on this mountain. 
But you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. What did Jesus do? Well, he refocused the discussion on the heart of the matter, the heart of the woman, when he said, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You see, when you worship God with all your heart, it matters little what building you're standing in. Amen? Remember, Scripture says that our bodies are the temple of the Lord. And spirit and truth transcend skin color, gender, racial, cultural, and religious divides. So as Christians, as we seek to be engaged in the cultural conversations of the day, we should do that. But like Jesus, we must not use the methods or the frameworks of the day if they don't fully reflect our calling and our values as Christians. Why? Well, because as Dr. Tony Evans famously reminds us, God has a kingdom agenda. He has a kingdom agenda. You see, Jesus didn't accept the culture's agenda because he had the kingdom agenda, a blueprint for how all of life is to be lived. And by the way, Dr. Evans unpacks this perspective in fantastic detail in his book called The Kingdom Agenda. I highly recommend it. But in short, that agenda is reflected in the two greatest commandments. To love God and to love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God with your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And second, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about it this way. Whenever you come to a meeting, there's an agenda on the table. So daily, we come to the culture's table on the internet, on TV, and social media, and the agenda is right there. But as Christians, you see, as, as Christians, we're supposed to reach into our holy briefcase, the Word of God, and pull out the kingdom agenda to guide us. So if there's anything on the culture agenda, any hashtag, post, tweet, perspective, that is not on the kingdom agenda or is in conflict with the kingdom agenda, it is not something that we should shape our viewpoints with. It shouldn't frame how we look at issues. It shouldn't frame our conversation. It shouldn't frame what movements we attach ourselves to if they're not on the kingdom agenda. And the kingdom agenda is love God, love your neighbor, pray for your enemies, and repeat. And at all times, seek unity in Christ. Hashtag love thy neighbor. Hashtag love thy neighbor. Now this brings me back to the conflict with those three words. And God gave me this insight. You see, when the culture says that if you care about black folks, you will say black lives matter or you will say, all lives matter. That's the culture framing the agenda on its terms. Don't you see? And here's the thing. The evil one, who's the biggest racist that ever existed because he hates the human race, doesn't care which one you say, just as long as you're in conflict with each other, especially in the church. And just as long as you don't say these three words, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, Jesus Christ saves. You can say any other three words you want, but just don't say those. You see, Jesus was constantly correcting and redirecting the culture with, you have heard it said, but I say. And I, and I think today Jesus would be saying, well, you know, you have heard it said that if you care about black people, you will say black lives matter or you will say all lives matter. But I say unto you, love thy neighbor and pray for your enemies. See, as Christians, we're not called to make sure people matter. We're called to love them. Why? Because when you love people, they know they matter. You know, I'm a black man. I'm like this all day. <laughs> all day. And when my wife says she loves me, I don't say, well, honey, do I matter? But if she said, I matter, I might say, honey, do you love me? 
You, you see, if you're someone who's trafficking young, vulnerable women, and I ask you, well, do these women matter? You say, absolutely. How else am I going to make my money? If I'm a slaveholder, and you came up to me and said, well, do black lives matter? I said, well, look out in the field. How am I going to get that cotton in? And plus, they're just three-fifths of a person, so every time I count them, I get extra representation in Congress. Of course they matter. But if you ask that slaveholder and that trafficker, do you love them? Ah, oh, that's a different thing. It's a different thing. You, you see, love is a higher thing, a more difficult call. And when Jesus said, render unto God what is God, that is what he was talking about. He is calling us to the higher standard of love, to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. See, if folks have this type of love, they won't, they won't complain about what kind of taxes they're paying because the taxes will be fair and they will be just. Too often, the culture asks us to pursue and seek the lower incomplete thing. For example, in the culture, you hear the exclaim, no justice, no peace. Now, of course, we should forcefully and consistently advocate for justice for all people at all times. But just think about our sinful existence. How many times we have fallen short of the glory of God? What if God just gave us justice? Would that bring you peace? Would that bring you peace? Would it bring me peace? Of course not. Justice alone will never be, bring peace. It must be coupled with mercy, and a key aspect of mercy is forgiveness. Of oh, no, the, the Prince of Peace used his dying words, and oh, by the way, he could not breathe. You think about that. Jesus is on the cross being crucified, and the way you die is that you can't breathe. So Jesus understands that dilemma well. And Jesus is pulling himself up on the cross trying to breathe. And with those last precious breaths, he turns to the thief on the cross, not the wrongly accused thief on the cross, and says, I forgive you. And he goes down again, and he pulls himself up again. All the time saying, I can't breathe. And he looks out and says, Father, forgive them. You see, you see, Jesus had a call for the victimizer to be just, to do what is right, but he also had the call for the victim to forgive. Now, I've had some people say to me, well, you know, when you talk about these issues and forgiveness, it's just too soon. And it takes me back to the cross, and I see Jesus with the crown of thorns and the blood dripping down his face and can't breathe, and he's saying, forgive me. I'm not saying, is that too soon? Too soon? I know that's difficult. Don't get me wrong. It takes the power of God to do that. But that's the call that we have as Christians. And so any movement that's just advocating for justice which, and not advocating for mercy, what is not advocating for forgiveness or any of those things, it's not on God's side. Can't be. See, because justice and mercy came together on the cross. And we should advocate for both. So yes, seek justice, yes. But also love, mercy, forgive as you walk humbly before God. But that's not something that you hear in the culture today because the culture is not solving for the same thing that the kingdom is. You see, I, I learned long ago as a black man that if I carried unforgiveness in my heart towards anybody based on what had happened to me, and I shared a little bit of this in, in the video that I did for you guys, or for my ancestors, for that matter, even as I advocated for justice, I was not on God's side. I was not on God's side. Now, I was really inspired by Booker T. Washington, a former slave, and he wrote these words, End Up From Slavery. He said, I learned that great men cultivate love, and only little men cherish a spirit of hatred. It is not long ago that I learned and resolved that I, would not that I would present no man, no matter what his color might be, to narrow and degrade my soul 
by making me hate him. I pity from the bottom of my heart any individual who is unfortunate as to get into the habit of holding race prejudice. He didn't just write that to white folks, he wrote that to black folks too. And, and he went on to say, interestingly, he said, you know, he'd even forgiven the family, the white family that had owned him. Now, that's an amazing statement from a man who faced the level of injustice and discrimination on a scale that is really pretty unimaginable in the United States today. But yet he said that that's a surprising statement, maybe to some, but not really, because he was a follower of Christ. He's a follower of Christ. And consider the words and the example of Dr. Martin Luther King. He marched with a clarion call for white folks and black folks of his day. For those who promoted Jim Crow, he called them to be just. And those who were subjected to Jim Crow, he called them to forgive. That's why in the same speech where he said that he was a drum major for justice, he also said, say that I was a drum major for peace. Oh, but if those words were on his monument in Washington, D.C. And oh, by the way, see, he, he, was, he was following this model of Christ. See, he was following the model of Christ because he had a message for the victimizer and for the victim. And, and Dr. King also said, and you, you certainly don't hear this today in the same speech, he said to say that he was a drum major for righteousness. Why? Because as Christians... We know, and he knew, that we're called to be righteous if we're going to be on God's side. Righteousness is something that comes from God, and it means being right in the eyes of God in terms of our character, our conduct, and our conscience. But righteousness is not on the culture's agenda today or on many of the movements that you see today. You know, several years ago, there was this campaign uh, in, in urban neighborhood in Baltimore and in other places across the country, and I remember reading about this, it was called the No Snitching Campaign. So there would be a crime committed against someone in the neighborhood, and the police would be called, but when they'd arrive, no one would tell them anything. No snitching. And as I considered this, it struck me that what was happening here was a lack of righteousness. Because a person who had Seeing an injustice was basically saying, I'm okay with injustice if the alternative is to expose someone in my community, in my tribe. And, and you know, if a police officer sees a fellow officer doing something wrong, an injustice, and he doesn't say anything, no snitching, and doesn't stop it, well, that too is a lack of righteousness. Because the silent officer is saying that I'm okay with injustice if the alternative is to expose somebody in my community, in my tribe. Do you see? As Dr. King reminded us, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So if we truly want to heal our land, heal our communities, heal our families, what we need is a rebirth of God-honoring righteousness in every corner of this nation. Amen? Amen. And see, if you, if you have that perspective, see, you don't read brand looting as something righteous. You, you don't do that. And, 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 and here's the other thing. You, 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 your compassion is comprehensive. It, it's from womb to tomb, as Dr. Evans loves to say. So that means if, if, if you have compassion towards someone who looks like me that's on a street and can't breathe, that it doesn't end, it extends all the way back to someone who looks like me in the womb who's fighting for a first breath. See, that's what a rebirth of righteousness looks like. Now, why is this so critical? Well, because it's connected to the core reason as to why Jesus came. He came to reconcile us to God and to reconcile us to each other. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he died on the cross. You can see the cross is a symbol 
of us being reconciled to God and being reconciled to each other. See, that's the kingdom agenda, loving God and loving our neighbor. And, and as the scripture says, all of us, all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us with what? A message of reconciliation. See, this is what Jesus was solving for when he calls us into the work that we do. And when he calls us as Christians, he calls us to a ministry of reconciliation. And, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, Jesus spoke to the systemic issues of the day. And that's one of the other flashpoints in the culture is there's systemic issues, systemic racism, not systemic racism. You know, that, that's one of the flashpoints. You've got to be on one side or the other in terms of how you discuss that. And lots of people uh, arguing about that too. But it's interesting to me when I thought about Jesus coming, he's, a, he's the master of the universe and, and he has all tools available to him. And he's solving for two things, reconciling man to God and reconciling man to each other. And he's got the tool belt of everything that he needs. And although Jesus spoke to the systemic issues of the day, Pharisees were a systemic issue of the day. How women were treated was a systemic issue of the day. Although he spoke to those issues, what, how did he spend his time with the woman at the well? He spent his time with individual hearts, with the disciples, with the Simons and the Matthews of the world, with Nicodemus. Why? Because he understood that if you have unjust people administering just laws, they won't follow them, and you will still have injustice. And if you have just people and the laws are unjust, they will change them, while still seeking reconciliation and restoration. You see, it's individuals that change systemic issues because it's individuals who can change systems. So that empowers each and every one of us. See, because here's the thing. If, if, you, if you feel like, well, there's systemic issues, I can't, you, you end up like Don Quixote fighting windmills. You end up angry, tearing stuff up, hurting people because you can't solve the systemic issues. But what you can do is that you can love someone. And as you love someone, you change someone's heart. And that happens at an individual level. Now, reconciliation, this is, this, is, this is not on the culture's agenda. It's not on the agenda of the movements that are birthed out of culture or promoted by the media. I don't think so. I mean, do you think that's there? I mean, today, there's no focus on reconciliation and restoration of all things, which was Christ's mandate to us. Just check the news. There is more desire for retribution and retaliation, for conflict and disunity. That's what we see. You see, in order for there to be true and lasting reconciliation, we have to be able to listen and hear another person's story. When we do, we find our story in their story. I remember some years ago, when I first met a white Southern friend of mine. Now on the surface, much like Simon and Matthew, we came from very different and conflicting worlds. I had some assumptions about him. I'm sure he had some assumptions about me. But then we had lunch and he shared his story. And I learned about the defining moment that shaped his life. You see, when he was just 16, years old, his parents dropped him and his two younger siblings off at home and said they were going to the store and would be back soon. Well, hours pass, then days pass. His parents never returned. And he struggled to help himself and his siblings survive until social services found out they were living alone, abandoned and rejected by parents he would never see again. And as I journeyed into his story, I could see my story as a black boy who grew up without a father that longed to have that father value me. As a black boy who often felt less than growing up. You see, I realized that this was a man who understood the pain and rejection 
that comes with being excluded for no fault of his own. This was somebody who, like the old Negro spiritual says, knows the troubles I see. And when I consider his story in the light of race, at the core, his story was one of rejection. And isn't that what any type of discrimination truly is? You see, I found my story in his story, a northern black man from Ohio, a southern white man from South Carolina, and we became friends, and we became brothers in Christ. Now, turning back to Simon the Zealot, the, the tax collector, I've often wondered what Jesus did to help them become brothers. Remember when Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs, two by two, you remember that? Wouldn't it be just like Jesus? <laughs> Wouldn't it be just like Jesus as he's looking around, he says, uh, you, uh, uh, and uh, you. And I'm sure the other disciples were like, this man has lost his mind. He is going to send a Trump supporter and a Biden supporter <laughs> out together. He has lost his mind. But I can imagine as those two men journeyed together, broke bread together, served the needy together, loved folks together, heard each other's stories, the walls came down, the bridges were built, and they connected heart to heart, reconciled. Moreover, as Matthew and Simon found, they each found his story in the other story, they both found their stories in Christ's story. What connected them was the love of Christ and the love for Christ. Amen? So when these two men returned to the surprise of everyone but Jesus, they were brothers who served together and died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Together. You see, to truly value another person, especially someone with whom you strongly disagree, it requires love. Why? Because love requires you to find your story in their story, and the common story of humanity that we share is the creation story, one that was penned by the one and only true God of love who created all women and men in his image. Moreover, he sent his only begotten son to call, him, call us to himself, not because we mattered, but because he loved us. You see, it, it, it's not some trending hashtag that is going to heal our nation. It's not a movement of man that will give us the peace that we long for. It's the love of Christ that leads to reconciliation and restoration. And you know, that's, that's why during this 45th anniversary for Karen, I'm so excited about the work that you ably do every single day. I mean, think about it. As part of CareNet, you're part of this tremendous God-honoring, life-saving ministry of reconciliation. You see, when a pregnant woman is told by the culture that she must be like Eve, who said, my fruit, my choice, and declare my body my choice, as she thinks that her only and best option is the abortion clinic, you meet her with the compassion of Christ. And you call her to be reconciled to the truth that the little one growing inside of her is not a life worth sacrificing, but a life worth sacrificing for. And that there's a God who loves her and who desires to be reconciled to her. And when a man who got the girl, got the woman pregnant, seeks to distance himself and absolve himself of the responsibility like Adam when he told God, this woman you gave me. You challenge, call, and inspire him to be reconciled to her and his unborn child and to step up to the responsibility and privilege of bringing the bone of his bone and the flesh of his flesh into this world. Moreover, you call him to be reconciled to a God who loves him. And you don't stop there. 
If at all possible, you seek to help this couple be reconciled to each other and to build a strong, God-honoring family as husband and wife. And of course, we know that's not always possible. But as pro-abundant life people, we know that the sanctity of life is linked to the sanctity of marriage and family as God designed. And you won't let the low standard of the culture's agenda stop you from casting a vision for the kingdom agenda for this couple, the higher idea of God's design for family. As you know, this approach and focus has yielded some tremendous results over the last 45 years. Indeed, over the last 12 years alone, by the grace of God, over 823,000 little ones have been given life as a result of the work that you guys do. And moreover, th th there have been 1.8 million gospel presentations through this network over that time. We also know that as pro-abundant life people, to be on God's side, we must also focus on God's call to discipleship. Why? Because the life issue is primarily a discipleship issue because it is a good work. Like water for the thirsty, food for the hungry, clothes for the naked, compassion for the pregnant. And every good work that Christians do, every good work that we do, just like every good work that Jesus did, is an on-ramp to discipleship. Our call, our call to those we serve in love, just like Jesus' call, is to come as you are, but don't stay as you came. Come as you are, but don't stay as you came. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And a key aspect of how we do this is really the Making Life Disciples Ministry, this initiative that's been launched about four years now, which seeks to engage the church, specifically small groups in churches, to offer compassion, whole help, and discipleship to those at risk for abortion. There are just so many amazing stories I've heard just recently, just over this last year, of CareNet-affiliated pregnancy centers and churches working together under this unique ministry model to reconcile clients in this ministry of reconciliation. For example, a woman came to a local pregnancy center that I'm familiar with. She was pregnant, had many children as well. The pregnancy center staff loved her and met her at her point of need. As they educated her about her options, they asked her if she'd like to be connected to a church's Making Life Disciples coordinator. And she said yes. Well, the Making Life Disciples coordinator met her and assessed her needs, and, and there were many. <laughs> and they were overwhelming. But the Making Life Disciples team responded. For example, they raised financial resources to provide child care, which was critical because this woman worked from home. The team even sought to engage the father who was not providing for this woman and her children. And since she would have to educate her kids from home due to COVID-19, they quickly coordinated a construction project with several other churches to turn the basement of the place where she was living into a learning center for her children, including work area for the kids, school supplies, storage, all of that. They washed her clothes, made meals, looked for any ways that they could to serve this woman. They even tutored her children, two of her children, in math and reading because they were struggling in these areas. Just amazing. And of course, they have discussed her relationship with God with her. The email D coordinator told me that this woman said to her that without this church, she would have no one. She would have no one. Indeed, life decisions need life support. And this is just one relatively small church. Just one. Working together with you guys. The amazing work that you're doing. That transition that moves from evangelism to discipleship. Imagine if just 1% of churches, there's over 400,000 churches, just 1% were doing that. That'd be 4,000 4, additional points of compassion. Partners in this ministry of reconciliation that God has called us to. And now here's the thing. 
This woman is black. And pretty much all the people who are given their time, their talent, and their treasure are white. So she and her children are seeing and experiencing people who don't look like her loving her and her children. See, I say often, see, you don't have to virtue signal when you're living a life of virtue. You don't have to virtue signal when you're living a life of virtue. You see, Jesus, this is how Jesus healed the divide between Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. They served each other. They served with each other. And this is how CareNet affiliates are uniquely positioned and called to heal the racial divide in this nation today. Do you see? Now, I know there's lots of things that people try to do. But I'm telling you, what this woman needed was someone to come alongside her. You can hashtag all you want. And virtue signal all you want. But at the end of the day, she just needed somebody who was going to do her laundry. That's why Jesus spent his time with the individual heart. He looked for the woman at the well, waiting for her. So don't ever let the culture tell you that what you're doing is not moving forward. I had so many people say, well, what are we going to be doing to heal the racial divide? I'm like, hold on a second. Black women are 6% of the population and 30% of our clients and have been for decades. Every time you help bring a child into the world, what are you saying? Oh, matters, get, forget that. Love. So somebody say, do Black Lives Matter? Say, I love folk. All lives matter. Well, I love folk. Don't tap into the culture's narrative. See, folks from, from, from different races, different cultures, working together with people from different races and different cultures, you, you have the answer that no Twitter campaign can compare to. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. You're ministers of reconciliation, amen? So don't use the culture's words to do God's work. Don't use the culture's methods to do God's work. Don't look to the media narrative to do God's work. We have the nativity narrative of the one who was an unplanned pregnancy from a human perspective, and he came with a plan. He came with an agenda, the kingdom agenda, to reconcile us to him and to reconcile us to each other. So sisters and brothers, let me say to you, let us keep pressing on despite the obstacles. Amen? Amen. Let us show the world the way. Amen? Let us keep loving those inside and outside the womb. Amen? Let us be on God's side. Amen? Amen. Have a joyous and blessed conference.